it's all about humanity. And we are live. Good evening, everyone. It is 6 p.m. here in the United Kingdom. Welcome to all my Bitcoin buddies from around the world. Uh, Today is the 15th of July, 2021. And as always, to start the show, Strong Bitcoin Hand. That is the name of the game of this show. Buy your coins, get them off an exchange, and then get on and enjoy your life, people, because life is really, really, really short. I'm really excited that I've got a live guest for you all today. So pound the like button. Let's get the preliminaries out the way before we get started. If you are finding my channel and you are new, please, 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 please do not take anything I say as financial advice. I am just some crazy Brit that chooses to go live a couple of times a week and talk about Bitcoin. Get in the rabbit hole, do your own research. And if you are going to invest in any type of asset, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin particularly, don't do it unless you can afford to lose it. This is a new and emerging asset. It might be a very exciting asset and a very exciting time to be alive, but I don't want to be the one responsible because you took something I said and went and bought some Bitcoin. So do your own research, people. Secondly, check out my work. UKBitcoinMaster.com is where you'll find every video I've ever done. And Bitcoin interviews, clearly, is where you are going to find the live interviews that I've done to date, including uh, this one. Once it is finished, it will go up on that website. And I've actually interviewed some of the greatest thought leaders in the Bitcoin space, in my opinion. BTC Sessions, uh, Bitcoin Meister, Ansel Linder, Vortex, Gabriel Devine. I've had... um, Uh, a couple of lawyers on from America. I've had plenty of people that I've interviewed on my BitcoinInterviews.com site. So do check it out, people, if you want to learn. Four years ago, I knew nothing about this. And all I'm doing twice a week is just talking to you guys about what I have learned. Finally, I don't do this show for any type of financial gain. It is simply me going live. And if I can touch one person and get them to catch the vision of where Bitcoin's going, how it's going to change the world, how it's going to change the world for generations to come, then that is all I want. But some people have reached out and said, how do I drop you a tip? Tip Tipping.me at UK Bitcoin Master if you want to do that. Okay, that is the preliminaries done. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I've uh, We've had some challenges uh, getting myself and this gentleman together, but we finally done it. I'm really, really excited uh, to introduce you, and I'm going to split my screen. Uh, Lord Fusitua from Tonga, welcome to the show, man. It's great to have you in the house. It's great to be on. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, and, and, and I've got to say, you're in a hospital bed, so is everything okay? Am, Are we good? Yeah, I, you can see uh, in the background there, this is uh, in hospital. So, uh, yeah, I had um, uh, surgery on uh, my leg and my hip and uh, got that sort of been a couple of months in hospital. Uh, touch wood, fingers crossed, should be out by the end of this month. So, yeah, it's it's not going too bad. And, and and am I right in saying you're in New Zealand, not Tonga? I am. No, no. I uh, I was here for medical treatment uh, a while ago uh, for nearly a year. Oof. And then just as I was recovering, um, COVID hit and our borders uh, became hard locked. Uh, we're a small island, uh, so 
uh, COVID, uh, if it came in, would pretty much wipe out our population. So uh, the hard lock borders have kept us uh, with uh, Palau, uh, Nauru, um, North Korea and Turkmenistan as the five countries that are still COVID free. Uh, so, yeah, still uh, stuck in New Zealand uh, because of COVID. Uh, but yeah, uh, they've treated me very well here, so uh, yeah, not going too badly. Well, wow, that's fantastic to hear. Firstly, um, so people forgive the fact that Lord Fushis. Oh, here we go. We had this off air. Fushis. Fushitua. Fushitua. I've been practicing for a couple of weeks. Fushitua. Fushitua. And I've practiced that so much. <laughs> and I thought to myself, yeah. I bet you, as soon as I get him on the call, he'll go and say, "No, you pronounce it differently." And you've done just that. <laughs> so, uh, no, listen. Th- thank you for being on the call with me. Um, firstly. Um, can I? May I ask? Uh, maybe the audience are thinking, "Crikey, that guy's really tattooed up." I, I believe that's something to do with your uh, your Tongan religion, faith, or w- what is it? Uh, yeah. So, firstly, I apologise for the informal attire. I have uh, cream on my back that makes it hard uh, to uh, wear a shirt or a hospital gown. Uh, hence, uh, all the hosts have been extremely. Um, uh, accommodating and accepted my informal attire uh, for the purposes of the interview. So, yeah, the tattoos are traditional Tongan tattoos. Uh, you may have seen uh, Samoan tattoos, Maori tattoos. Uh, we're all Polynesian, and uh, tattoo comes from the Polynesian word tata uh, for tattoo. That's where the, the English word comes from. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, the left half of my body uh, tells uh, the lineage uh, of my father's side and uh, the clan. Uh, my father, from whom, obviously, uh, I inherited my title, uh, which, like the UK, is uh, through primogeniture. Um, so the tale of uh, the lineage of the title as well as uh, the clan to which that title uh, uh, is a member of. Uh, the right side, uh, my mother is the granddaughter of another lord from another part of the country, and it tells the lineage of, of her, uh, her family's title. Wow. Uh, and includes um, my, my land, my estate, uh, my island, which I'm from, is the northernmost in Tonga and is actually um, closer to Samoa and Fiji than it is to Tonga. Uh, so the original inhabitants of that island uh, were not Tongans. Uh, they were from the Marquesan Islands. Uh, and uh, Tonga eventually conquered it and made it part of Tonga. But uh, when I was at the Australian National University uh, in Canberra, uh, it has, opposite the law school, is the Institute for Pacific Studies, which is the largest archive of Pacific uh, uh, documents and artifacts in the world. Okay. So I actually found a, a manuscript that had uh, drawings from the original settlers of the island my state is on. Wow. And I was able to incorporate that into uh, my family, the, the current uh, occupants. Uh, I mean, the current occupants. Uh, my family uh, has been on this land for... Uh, about a millennia, so I'm the 20th uh, person to hold this title, so it goes back uh, a fair way, uh, and yeah, that's what the tattoos are. So is that and... hen- hence Lord Fusitua, is that is that something that you have inherited down through generation? I mean, how, how does, I mean, I, I know that you've said on a couple of other podcasts that you, we've, you've got a parliament sort of similar to the United Kingdom, do you want to sort of explain that's that? That's right. Uh, yeah, so The title Lord uh, is uh, an honorific uh, which we adopted uh, when we uh, became Christianized uh, and uh, turned our ancient um, Polynesian Tongan monarchy uh, and hybridized it uh, into uh, a modern uh, Westminster constitutional monarchy uh, and therefore codified 
our traditions into uh, a constitution and laws. And one of those uh, institutions was our, our, our Tongan uh, chieftainships. Uh, the various warriors who had chieftainships throughout the country uh, became 33 uh, houses under the constitution. There were 33 houses uh, of the nobility, uh, each carrying a title uh, and an estate. Uh, and they are passed down by primogeniture, uh, which means father to son, father to son. Uh, and therefore, uh, I currently hold the title because I inherited from my father, who was the previous Lord Fusitua. So I'm the 20th Lord Fusitua uh, uh, to hold this title. And uh, by virtue of that, uh, I also inherit, inherit an estate, uh, which is... Uh, in our land act, every uh, title to state is uh, the boundaries are delineated in the land act, uh, and our titles uh, accompanied by uh, the villages or islands uh, which constitute the estate. This and uh, it's, it's similar to, similar to uh, feudal Britain, uh, but ours was less a relationship between a lord and tenants. Uh, which is a, 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 a sort of um, early uh, feudal uh, hybrid into capitalism. Uh, there's a very capitalist uh, notion of private property there. Uh, in uh, Polynesian tradition, uh, the chief is a warrior uh, who's the custodian of the land. We don't consider it private property. Uh, we consider him the custodian of the land whose duty it is to protect the people who live on it and the land uh, and provide for them. Uh, so that uh, notion of uh, responsibility and duty remains to this day, um, which is why in my political role, it's a very easy transition across from traditional leadership to political leadership uh, and uh, ensuring that the people on my land have access to education access to health care, access to justice, things that are considered, or we consider, basic human rights. Yeah. It's my job to ensure that they are provided for that. Uh, uh, people's representatives who are elected by uh, universal suffrage, uh, they come for terms of four years. Uh, my duty to protect them begins at birth and ends at death. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a lifelong duty. Um, so, by virtue of that, uh, we have a, a legislative assembly, which is uh, an amalgam of the House of Lords and House of Commons. We have them all within one uh, unicameral house. So, we have 26 uh, seats, uh, 17 of which are for people uh, elected by universal suffrage, and nine of which are uh, for the Lords uh, to elect uh, amongst themselves. Uh, therefore, uh, in House 26, 14 is a majority. It's it's weighted that way so that the 17 people's reps can always form a government without us if they wish to do so, or if they wish, uh, can have a government of national unity and have some Lords uh, in there to provide uh, traditional uh, contributions to uh, the dialogue in the Cabinet. So let me ask you a question, if I may, <clears throat> and I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Um, I, I'm, yeah. a, I'm, I'm a regular Brit who's worked hard all of his life. Yeah. I spent 20 years driving a truck for a living. Um, so I'm not I'm not well educated, left school early, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. you know, when I when I um, go through my life and I, I, I hear of or see, um, you know, things on the news about the House of Commons and the House of Lords, all I see as a Brit is a load of corrupt individuals that are lining their own pockets and just doing good yeah. for themselves. And I'm well, sure I'm... many of them came into politics to try and do better, but got pushed right. along by the stuff that, you know, the backhanders and everything else. What makes Tongan... Is there, is there something that, that, that makes Tongan government maybe different to that? A smaller nation? Uh, do, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so... The population of our country is 100,000. Wow. So our country could fit into 100,651. So wow. we could probably fit into Wembley or, or O2. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
and 5% of that are now ethnic Chinese immigrants okay. uh, who've naturalized as Tongan citizens. So uh, for the people's reps, uh, of course, uh, the, the temptation for corruption is there. Yeah. Uh, particularly, we used to have national reps. So uh, for, say, for the main island group, Dongatapu, there were three uh, MPs mm. and the whole of Dongatapu uh, would vote and the, pers the people who got the top three votes uh, would become the MPs. Uh, but we've now split them up into constituencies. So Dongatapu was split up into 10 constituencies and the rest of the country split up into seven constituencies. That means each politician is really going to try and just work for his constituency when he gets into parliament because those are the only people that vote for him. So he's not too fussed about national affairs. So that's yeah. one of the drawbacks of breaking it up into constituencies. Constituencies are supposed to be more democratic because it gets right down to grassroots where you're representing the actual people that you live with. Uh, but as I said, the concern is that you'll only take their interests to the house. So you'll only make sure their roads are paved. You'll only make sure their schools are given funding uh, as opposed to other roads or schools because these are the people that will vote for you. Yep. Uh, yep. And it takes your focus away from national concerns. Um, and with a country the size of ours, uh, national concerns are paramount uh, in a country of uh, 40 to odd 50 million like the UK um, national con uh, local concerns can mean hundreds of thousands of, or millions of people yeah uh, definitely. here yeah the maximum uh, the largest electorate uh, has 5,000 voters uh, so the the registered voters are 53,000 so if he just works with those 5,000 people then everyone else misses out Right. So, uh, yeah, the, there is a concern and they have to be monitored. Uh, and we have uh, what are called constituency visits. As soon as Parliament opens, uh, as with most uh, parliaments, we have to do budget. Yep. As soon as budget's passed, then we have constituency visits where all 17 reps and the nine lords go out into, to their constituencies and hold town halls and are given a list of priorities and they take that back to Parliament and they have to present the, that list to Parliament. Okay. And then in the next financial year, they have to show that they've met uh, those requests that came directly from the town halls, uh, from the grassroots, from the ground up. Yep. And if they have it, then they have to explain why in Parliament. Okay. So, so there is a danger yeah. uh, for um, nepotism and focusing solely on a small group but there is a check and balance against it. Uh, for the Lords, uh, although it seems like we're only voting for each other, uh, you have to remember we also represent our entire estates. So, like I said, the Polynesians, uh, the politicians come and go every four years yeah. uh, with their life. Uh, so we also come with the concerns of our, of our estates and yeah. we're with them for longer. So we have to... We, have to see through projects that might not fit in one political term. It might take three or four political terms in a politician's life cycle, yep. but that 20 years, we're there to, to do the hard yards all for, across the whole 20 years. Uh, so that's why we're in Parliament, uh, similar to senators. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, most most politicians, and I, I just, I'm just generalising. It's like, <clears throat> let's get into, let's get into Parliament, and let's do what we can for four years, and get out with, you know, unscathed, yeah. and leave the mess to the rest. The next, the next that's one right. coming in. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, I look, yeah, let, 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 let's start to. That's fascinating. I, I could spend hours talking about this. I mean, the the, the problem is, you know, I'm not a well travelled guy. You know, so I literally had to look where Tonga was, and I then saw right. it is off the northeast um, of New Zealand. I did spot that much, and that's it is right. tiny, isn't it? But let, let, let's right. talk, let, let's get into you know why I wanted to get you on the show, if I may. Um, um, in the interest of your time, I, I know it's very late for you or the small hours. So, yeah, I guess you can sleep for a bit and then wake up and do an interview, then sleep for a bit more. Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> so That's basically what I've been doing. Ah, uh, awesome. Can't, but, you, but surely you're missing your family terribly. Are you FaceTiming or something of that nature, video calling? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've got two of my three kids live here in New Zealand. Ah, gotcha. Uh, so they're here. Uh, and my mother's here and uh, some of the relatives. I've got lots of, like most uh, Polynesians, uh there are lots of relatives here in New Zealand, Australia, and the US. So, gotcha. Yeah, I'm 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 in good stead. Gotcha. Um, so, what I want to do, I want to talk about Tonga, Bitcoin right. remittances, El Salvador. How did you hear about all this? Let's go back. Tell me about your. How did you discover Bitcoin? When did you discover Bitcoin? What were your thoughts around Bitcoin? I'm fascinated by this. Right. So, um, a cousin of mine who's like my brother, he, uh, he and I, uh, I've said this on other podcasts because it's, it's a, uh, a fond memory for me. He and I taught us to, uh, we taught each other to program in basic, uh, on, I'm not sure whether you remember, uh, Sir Clive Sinclair had a computer company called Sinclair Computers. I had one. I had a, a yeah. Commodore 64 as well, and I also had a Sinclair oh. ZX, Spectrum. ZX Spectrum. And do you know something? Sorry to interject. It took me no. two whole days of typing to create yeah. a British flag. It was yeah, like yeah. Exactly. such a drama. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And all it did was That's, produce a, a flag. <laughs> yeah, it was in basic. Exactly. We were all using basic then. Yeah. yeah. So... The ZX Spectrum, as you'll remember, is the one with the rubber calculator keys. Yep. yep. And I, was very, uh, I always wanted the Commodore 64 that had the actual computer keyboard. Yep. Yep. So Sinclair actually re released uh, a uh, computer keyboard, uh, which you just take the, the casing off the Spectrum and plug it in and insert it inside the keyboard, uh, and then it would be like a Commodore 64. Wow, didn't know that. Uh, <clears throat> So, yeah, it, you loaded the applications by audio tape. Uh, and you'd have Ooh, I remember that. Like, <laughs> yeah. And they sounded like uh, the, the modem did when you used to plug into the telephone. Oh, that horrible so squealing squeak, noise. Squeal. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Yeah. So he, um, he moved to America, my cousin, and uh, he contacted me uh, in 2013. And he said... Um, oh. There's this new protocol uh, uh, technology. Uh, it's sort of like a, a monetary system uh, for digital money, and you're going to like it, trust me, because we, we both know what each of us were into. And he said, there's no way you can buy any from there, but I'll get some for us, and uh, when I come to Tonga, I'll show you how it works, and I'll show you how I can I can give it to you. 2013. Uh, yeah, so he came to Tonga and he said, uh, yeah, I was like, so where's the that Bitcoin thing you're talking about? And he was like, yeah, so um, I ended up um, sort of having not as much money as I thought I would uh, during a patch there. And uh, I was a little bit drunk <laughs> uh, and the price had gone up ever so slightly. And I needed the money, so I sold it. Uh, and I was like, well, that's absolutely no use to me whatsoever. <laughs> so that was the first, yeah. That was the first time Bitcoin was dangled in front of my eyes and um, surreptitiously uh, ripped away from it. Uh, oh. And very unceremoniously. So, yeah, three years later, uh, 2016, I was already in Parliament uh, and anyone that lives in the developing world uh, will know this phenomenon. Uh, we have uh, very uh, fast-talking American businessmen, uh, usually in a Miami Vice suit, yeah. uh, who tell you they'll make you a million dollars uh, in the week, in a week, uh, and they take your money, and yeah, you don't see them anymore. So he convinced myself. He didn't need much convincing. For me, I, I had read the white paper, yep. and uh, as I was telling Peter, I thought I'd had my head around the uh, technology. I found out much later I, I hadn't uh, yet. 
uh, and a number of the other lords, and we invested. We gave him the money to buy us some, and he told us, excuse me, he'd buy That's it cool. uh, yeah. and, and uh, bring it to us and, uh, yeah, show, show us how he could hand it over. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, any knowledge of the technology would realise uh, that he did not know what he was talking about. Uh, but we invested, uh, and he took the money, uh, and uh, he gave us some uh, ideas about uh, developing agriculture, which actually weren't too bad, but didn't end up panning out in the end. Mm. Uh, but as these gentlemen uh, often do, uh, more often than not, uh, we never heard uh, from him again. <laughs> so for the second time, Bitcoin was very cruelly dangled in front of and me. And it didn't only... put you off, or did it? Uh, no, no, not not as yet. The, okay. the technology sounded interesting. Uh, my grasp of the white paper, although very rudimentary at the time, uh, yeah, it, it seemed uh, it's, it seemed to make sense to me. Uh, so, so far, fast forward. Then what happened? Obviously, he went away, and you got on with yeah, life so again. He went working. Away. Yeah. And then three years ago, uh, I got uh, gravely ill. Um, I died clinically in oh. Tonga. Uh, they had to revive me and. Uh, the surgeons on island at the time and our surgical resources uh, weren't sufficient for the surgery I needed. Uh, so they kept me alive for 36 hours while they uh, scoured the Pacific for an air ambulance. Uh, they rang Auckland, couldn't get one. Sydney, couldn't get one. They found one in Brisbane, uh, in Australia. Uh, so they kept me alive for that 36 hours while the air ambulance came and airlifted me to Auckland. Um, so it brought me to Auckland. Uh, the OR staff, I am told, were on the tarmac. Uh, that's how uh, uh, critical it was. Every minute uh, longer is more likely that I'd die. Yeah. Uh, so they got me in. Uh, all my organs had crashed. Uh, my body had gone septic. Uh, and two surgeries... Three surgeries over a period of two days uh, saved my life. Uh, I collapsed in July uh, and I woke in Tonga and I woke up in September and uh, I woke, yeah, I woke up uh, in September in New Zealand uh, two months later. Uh, and it then took me another six months of acute care uh, to be able to just sit up uh, and stand up and make it to the bathroom so there, I was, by the grace of god go i crikey yeah it was it was it was pretty full on uh, the surgeon said uh they have never seen anyone that ill well they have but they're all cadavers they have never seen anyone that ill uh survive um so yeah it was and with six months uh in which you can barely uh raise a mobile phone screen uh, to your face uh, to read, let alone uh, press buttons or try and play a game. I could just hold the phone up. So with six months uh, and a bit longer with absolutely nothing to do, um, I ended up uh, reading every word uh, about uh, Bitcoin that had been published, uh, every word uh, about Oh, I've lost uh, your sound. Ah, you're uh, back. Yeah. You're back. So sorry. Um, I read every word uh, that had ever been printed about Bitcoin, every uh, uh, audio or video uh, publishing of Bitcoin that had ever been done, and yeah, spent the rest of that year uh, researching, um, uh, like nonstop, twenty-four hours a day, because there was nothing else to do. Yeah. Uh, so in doing so, I realized uh, that this technology, uh, this monetary system, this asset uh, would be an asset that would appreciate uh, at an alarming rate 
uh, for anyone in the developed world yep. and would uh, form the foundation uh, for future financial freedom and most likely generational wealth. I think so. Uh, but for uh, the emerging markets in the developing world like Tonga, uh, it could make uh, life-changing um, paradigm uh, altering uh, effects uh, right now, immediately. Uh, and that's because of the large reliance of emerging markets on uh, remittances. So stop there for a so, moment. Let me just let me just uh, hold the thought for a moment. So yeah, were absolutely. you aware of all of this before this big? Well, you obviously were. But, you know, I mean, did El Salvador kicking it off spur you on? Were you doing things behind the scenes around this before the El Salvador announcement? I mean, Jack Mallers, he's a flipping... He's incredible. The guy's yes, incredible. Absolutely. He really is. But how how did all this? Because for me, you know, all I know as a regular guy, all I was hearing and seeing was, you know, the 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 big Bitcoin. It's the guys that know their stuff saying, you know, a nation state. Well, eventually, it's going to be a nation state. Eventually, you know, and you think, yeah, yeah, will it? Will it? Oh, you know, we hope it will. Will it? Then all of a sudden, wham! Miami conference, bam! Uh, El Salvador. What was going on for you around this before El Salvador, or was that a catalyst? For you yeah so before el salvador as i was saying uh there's a large dependence on remittances in emerging markets uh it's a 700 billion dollar uh, uh industry annually yeah um and in tonga uh our our, G, uh, our gdp is made up uh 41 percent of remittances so nearly half our gdp is made up of remittances sent from abroad uh, so what you have to know about remittances is uh, when you send them by Western Union uh, in Tonga, uh, we did the numbers, and on average, they take a 30% cut in fees. Uh, as Jack Mallis said in his interview uh, with Peter McCormack, in El Salvador, it's, it's above 50% mm. in fees. So uh, I realised uh, that Bitcoin would be a lot cheaper so even before El Salvador, we've been sending uh, warm wallet remittances back uh, on layer one, on the base layer for quite a while now. Yeah. Because even with the higher fees on layer one, it's still save a, a factor, fortune. Yeah. Yeah. By a factor of 4x to 10x, cool. it's cheaper than Western Union. Uh, yeah, by a lot. And you have to remember, if you're sending a million dollars, a uh, hundred dollar, a fifty dollar fee uh, at Western Union. It's a lot higher than that. At thirty percent, it's close to uh, yeah, uh, thirty thousand dollars. But um, uh, three hundred thousand uh, dollars, right? But uh, in Western Union, the average uh, payment in El Salvador, uh, in Tonga, is a relative who's working as a housekeeper abroad or in an unskilled job sending 50 or or $100 back a week or a month. So if you take 25 or $50 out of that, that's half the remittance gone. Uh, so... Uh, it's almost yeah, like overnight. Up. Overnight, you literally change that, don't you? That, that dynamic changes instantaneously. Instantly, instantly. Uh, so with layer one, uh, it's, yeah, it's life-changing. But... When for for no, sorry for for noobs for noobs if you're watching the channel layer one is the Bitcoin layer and then of course we've got the lightning on top carry on sorry so on the base layer uh, to warm wallets uh, it's it's life changing um, we have as I said with five percent of our our um, population is ethnically Chinese yeah uh, when Hong Kong went back to China a lot of Chinese merchants fled. Uh, to take their businesses elsewhere, and a lot came to Tonga. Uh, and then the same has happened from Guangzhou, which is uh, the southernmost province in China. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of merchants came from there. Guangzhou exports uh, nearly 2 million uh, tourists a year. Wow. Uh, they're the largest uh, tourism originating uh, uh, city uh, on the planet. So those merchants came. And the poorer Chinese who worked with them came also. Uh, the significance of that is that they're used to dealing in digital fiat. 
uh, they use an app called WeChat in China. So yep. when you come out of a, a subway or a bank in China, there are beggars sitting on the sidewalk. And uh, myself and my ex-wife were, before our, our country had a full embassy in China, uh, we were the honorary consulate uh, for uh, a num two years back in the early 2000s. So uh, I've lived in Beijing and seen this. Those beggars uh, used to have their hands out. Uh, now they hold out a mobile phone. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a phone now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They wanted to hit them with WeChat uh, with some dollars. So that being the case in Tonga, it wasn't a great leap. Uh, they understood uh, stacking sets uh, and they began accepting sets uh, because they themselves, uh, Chinese traditionally, don't bank very much. They, mm. they hoard their fiat under their mattresses um, and they're doing so with sats now as well. Uh, so on warm, with the warm wallet, we've been doing very well. And then President Bukele laid out the playbook. Uh, uh, Bukele and Jack Mallers laid out the playbook for the uh, developing world. And it was brilliant through Strike uh, and the Lightning Network. Uh, it's even better than layer one. Uh, when you spend a hundred dollars, it's effectively free because yep. it costs zero 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 two sats. Yep. You end up, uh, you you get lost counting the zeros. It is that cheap. It's a small uh, it fraction of a penny. Just so tiny is my new, isn't it? Ridiculous. And it costs the same to send a hundred as it does a thousand, as it does a million. Uh, so that is game changing. Well, it's interesting uh, you've been means... saying that because I've been playing around with two or three different lightning wallets and moving sats around. And whether you move a hundred or a thousand or a hundred thousand, the fee is always it shows up as zero. It's exactly. always zero. So yeah. mass, massive deal. Yeah, massive deal. It means that when we our forty percent of our GDP that's made up of remittances. Effectively, we're only receiving in real terms about 21% of that 40% because 19% uh, is eaten by the fees. So that, that gets restored. So the 30% in general uh, in a GDP of 500 million, uh, it's about 220 million is 40%. Uh, and 30% uh, of that being taken out is about 60 65 million uh, so we're putting 30 percent of value back into uh, the remittance receivers pocket so their disposable income increases by 30 percent yep therefore they are able to to uh, increase their standard of living um, by having more disposable income uh, and they are also because our country, uh, like many who have an informal economy, has a GST or a, a VAT, mm. a goods and services tax of 15%. Uh, that's so that people who don't usually fall under income tax, the income tax net, like uh, traditional farmers and traditional fishermen, yep. uh, that way you're still able to tax them because they have to pay uh, GST on buying a fishing net or... Uh, improvements to their boat or uh, buying a tractor. Uh, so that 15%, you're now giving everyone an extra 30% to pay into that 15%. Yeah. So government gets an extra 30% of capital uh, injected into the velocity of capital uh, that constitutes the economy. So they're happy? So, so they're happy as well. And then eventually the people uh, who are getting $100 instead of 70 will remember, uh, I actually got by on 70 It was hand to mouth, but I got by, which is why the 30 is so great, because it, it it's surplus to us. So eventually, uh, they're going to think, well, I'll get by on that 70 and I might save that 30 from now on, yeah. uh, because <laughs> I've never had, uh, for a fisherman in a village, who never had uh, a glimpse of any likelihood of being able to afford savings, can now uh, live on the 70 and have savings with the 30. 
And because Strike allows you to hold in Bitcoin or fiat, uh, if you're worried about price discovery, you can hold it in fiat. If you want to earn 200% per annum on a uh, pristine asset, you hold it in Bitcoin. So you end up stacking sats. And therefore, every person in the country who's stacking sats, their net value increases by 200% every yep. year. Yep. So the net value of the entire economy increases by 200% per annum. And this is something that doesn't need an act of parliament, doesn't need endorsement by the central bank. All it needs is an extra app on everyone's phones. And in my country, we have 99.95% uh, not just cell phone, uh, smartphone yep. uh, penetration. Yep. So just an extra app on the phones and an extra app on those Chinese vendors' uh, iPad or Android tablet at the point of sale. And we already know, as I said, they accept, them, uh, they accept it as currency, mm -hmm. even though it's not officially currency. The vendors accept it. Uh, and they, you've, you've increased your GDP by 30% with a purely commercial uh, solution. Uh, no need for state intervention or endorsement whatsoever. So, uh, so President Bukele has actually made it legal tender. I think that comes into force in, I right. believe it's September. So, what is what is the plan in Tonga? I know I listened on the other podcast, and you were saying, particularly to Peter, that you know, for for, for Tonga, it seems to work in reverse. You've you've you've, you've looked at lightning first and Bitcoin second. Explain that. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's what's happened in El Salvador. Yeah. Anywhere in the developing The Bitcoin world, beach, yep. Yeah, it begins uh, in the developed world, uh, Bitcoin metamorphosized into a store of value. Yep. So most people uh, buy as an investment to store. There's some very, there's a few uh, uh, people uh, who, for reasons I cannot understand, trade in Bitcoin. But most uh, most people uh, invest uh, and hold mm. uh, so as a store of value, and then uh, it'll eventually we're beginning to see it move towards um, a medium of exchange. Yeah, uh, as more uh, vendors accept it in the West and work towards uh, a unit of account eventually. Uh, whereas in El Salvador and places like us. It will begin as a medium of exchange. Uh, it will begin as being transacted in, and then eventually, as people learn about it, it will move to a store of value as they understand, begin understanding what stacking sats means. So it's back to front. Instead of store of value to medium of exchange, we're going medium of exchange to store of value. Uh, and that shows how pristine the asset is. Uh, back to front, it still works perfectly at, at being life changing. It's so profound, isn't it? I mean, it if, is. if if I you know. can't if you can't see how profound this is for the world, um, you know, the one thing that the, the, the phrase that I kept hearing when I got into Bitcoin is we're going to bank the unbanked. This is happening. Exactly. And it's the most El if, Salvador. That's right. El Salvador if people aren't excited. What's wrong with them? Seriously, it's like mind blowing to be able to have your money. bank on your phone to move money. I mean, we were on a we've got a, we've got a group on my show that we meet up once a month uh, on Zoom. We have a meet up offline. Well, it's online, but not, you know, not on YouTube. And we just get to know each other and we talk Bitcoin. And it was really interesting because one of my buddies in California, you know, there was a new guy into Bitcoin who um, literally was sort of learning about it all and investing. And, you know. Right. Rocky said to him, where are you? He said, I'm 150 miles off the north coast of Scotland on an oil rig. And basically he said, right, I want you to download this wallet. He did it. He said, right, now um, click receive. He held the QR code up to his camera. And from California, yeah. he sent him Satoshis that were instantaneously on his phone, 100 mi 150 miles north of Scotland. Exactly. Never been known before. Never. I've actually done a FaceTime test uh, using uh, Moon. That's what uh, I use, Moon. Yeah, yeah, and the the receiver it actually came up as received on his screen before you before, had... it, before yeah. it came up as sent from on my screen. I've done that, that from my wallet of Satoshi, and it says sending, and I've gone over to the Moon wallet, and it's already there. 
Yeah. And he's still sending. It's like, forgive me, I get really excited about all of this because p- if people don't understand how this is changing the world, how it's going to bank those poor people, you know, people like in your country that, are, you know, the remittances, the fees have been charged. It's the most phenomenal thing. And I'm just so I feel so proud and so privileged to be alive at this time. I really exactly. do. The privilege to be involved with it. And the funny thing is, in El Salvador, uh, 70% of the country are unbanked. So it will give them uh, access uh, to a bank. But also, even in the West, <clears throat> everyone who has a bank account, uh, it, it's banking the bank because your bank account, uh, you don't own that money. Nope. Uh, not until you have your Satoshis uh uh, or Bitcoin in a warm wallet or in a uh, hard wallet in your pocket, mm. that's when you're sovereign over your finances. So even the people who thought they were banked aren't really banked and are now being banked by uh, Bitcoin. So it's it's banking all of us across the world, uh, those who had access to fiat banks and those who didn't are now uh, leapfrogging over fiat banks and going straight to a Bitcoin bank in their in their pocket. Uh, I know you probably have seen uh, Jack uh, Maller's interview with Peter McCormack uh, and that young lad that he met in El Salvador oh. who told him, I'm a fisherman, my father was a fisherman, my grandfather was a fisherman, I don't have a bank account, I will never have a bank account, but I've got a warm wallet and I've got a ledger and I can now be financially free. Uh, and yeah, that's what it's about, man. It's there's there's an old like, saying, isn't there? And I believe in this. I mean, I I came into Bitcoin in in uh, mid 2017, and I came in for the profit, let's say. And then you get in the rabbit hole and you start learning about Bitcoin, and eventually you stay for the revolution. And I am in Bitcoin um, because a I want you know the rest of my life for my lovely wife to see the world a little bit, maybe get down to Tonga and see what it's like down there, meet you guys. I mean, I've got such a dream, Lord. For, for, oh dear, for such a. <laughs> Uh, I've got a dream to meet all these people that I keep interviewing and getting to know um, online in person, shake the hand, give them a hug, have a drink with them. And this is such a big deal. So there is an element of profit for us. You know, I'm 62, but the bulk of it is for my my uh, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, the same for them. And I want and, and I'm being a bit selfish here. I want to leave a legacy where for generations to come in my family, they talk about me because i had the guts i had the balls if i can use that to stand firm when everybody was laughing at me everybody was ridiculing me and i literally teach this on my show you are not banked unless you buy it and then you move it off that exchange or that bank onto your hardware wallet if you don't do step three and then step four learn your security you are not banked you do not own your bitcoin you know, 100%. so I just think we need more and more um, people like myself, yourself, getting out there, talking to people, you know, educating people, because we are still so very early in this. So early. Just this week, uh, the Australian National Sovereign Fund uh, has bought uh, 5% of their, their treasuries are now in Bitcoin uh, to break. Uh, their CEO has said uh, inflation's uh, uh, consuming, uh, eating away the value uh, of our members' uh, funds has just made it impossible not to make this decision. This is the only asset uh, that will guard that value. So there's that's nation-state adoption. That's, that's the country's sovereign wealth fund. Uh, so how do you see this playing out? I mean, do you do you see, I mean, we, we, we keep hearing about, you know, other um, South American countries. But then when you dig beneath the surface, you know, it is somebody in, you know, their their parliament that hasn't got much sway and, you know, that type of thing. Um, how do you see this playing out? You know, you are in, you know, the parliament. You are a lord down in Tonga. You know, we know what's going on in El Salvador, but surely... Uh, Lord Fasitua, surely, surely, surely we are going to get pushback from government. Surely. How do you think that's oh, going to play out? 100%. There's, it's, it's not a coincidence that President Bukele is getting uh, hit with uh, uh, hit pieces by Reuters 
uh, and all the legacy media uh, who have uh, uh, the G7 have vested interests uh, in those media outlets. Do you think they'll try and discredit him and then discredit Bitcoin uh, through him? They, they currently are. If you, if you check the articles, Reuters uh, included uh, a list of people in South America most disliked by the American government. He wasn't even on the list, but Reuters put his picture uh, in the article uh, just to make him look bad. Um, and uh, there is article after article attacking him personally uh, and making that as a dictator. Everything that they can do uh, to uh, yeah, undermine his efforts in El Salvador. Uh, the Under Secretary of State uh, of the US uh, with some diplomats have sent an uh, in inverted commas an anti corruption uh, sort of uh, visit to South America to only three countries El Salvador, Panama, and Paraguay. Uh, and those three countries have absolutely nothing in common apart from the fact that they uh, have already or are in the process of adopting Bitcoin. Uh, so there's absolutely going to be pushback, particularly from the G7 nations who have uh, very uh, entrenched uh, fiat central banking systems that go back uh, centuries. Uh, and uh, the Cantillon effect is, is very uh, strong oh, there. Yeah. Uh, these central bankers uh, are not elected officials uh, and are very often uh, families that have been doing this for generations, uh, being central bankers uh, in this system as well as the people uh, behind it, um, prominent families whose names are synonymous with wealth, uh, who uh, have a great influence on them and a vested interest uh, in the fiat system to ensure that uh, the two thirds of the planet or four billion of us in emerging markets mm. remain mm. either a plantation for them, a mine or uh, a supply of uh, of uh, unskilled labor uh, and Bitcoin not only gives access to generational wealth uh, to the people uh, who are the colleagues of these central bankers, it gives people who are in those plantations and those mines and uh, the unskilled labor they have equal access to generational wealth through Bitcoin yeah. uh, because Bitcoin uh, is classless, uh, permissionless uh, and does not recognize uh, creed, race, color, religion uh, or socioeconomic class. I was going to say, n never in my wildest, I won't say dreams, that's the wrong thing to say, but never in my wildest dreams, if I use that term, or would I have mixed and had a conversation with a lord in parliament? I, I simply don't move you know, in those circles, my family are working class. And yet here we are having this honest you know, discussion around Bitcoin, etc. And I find it fascinating. I find it liberating. I find it exciting. Like you said, no class. I'm working class. You're a lord in parliament. It's just the most I, incredible if thing. You, if I saw you in a pub, I would probably approach you for a drink because we have the same haircut and the same beard. Uh, but yeah, I feel... <laughs> well, maybe we'll end out having a drink together at some point. People, I, I've got to say, I, forgive I, me, forgive me. I haven't got my chat open on this live show because there's too much going on here. And I wanted to focus on Lord Fusitua because he's in hospital. Oh, okay. So people, if you're in the chat and you're speaking, I can't see it. Forgive me for that. But pound the like button, share this out. Really, really, really important. Um, Lord Fusitua, we are heading towards the hour mark. I'm very mindful of your time. I know it's the middle of the night down there in New Zealand no for you. No <laughs> um, don't, but don't, it, don't it's, for me. well, uh, it's been an absolute blast. Is, is. is there anything you want to add to the discussion we've had so far for my listeners? Uh, I think, yeah, our, our, just to lay out our general plan or my general plan. I was going to ask you that. Thank you. Yes. What's going to happen down in Tonga? Yeah. So the commercial solution is doable ASAP. Uh, as I said, it only involves uh, addition of an extra app to our phones. Yep. Uh, and um, there's a company you, you may or may not be familiar with uh, called Digicel. It's an Irish company. Heard of it, uh, but, yep. But they operate mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, 
uh, the Caribbean, uh, South and Central America, and the Pacific. Uh, they make their money off the developing world. Uh, and they do so by credit top-ups, but yep. more, uh, more so by being uh, a conduit for digital fiat uh, remittances. Yep. So yep. you can log on to a website, uh, enter your credit card and or banking details, and uh, the remittance will go straight to the digital phone uh, of the recipient. So they've ensured nearly 100% uh, cell phone penetration uh, wow. in Tonga. Wow. So that they take advantage of that uh, remittance market. Yep. So that means, ironically, uh, and they also have rolled out the point of sale hardware at all the Chinese vendors uh, to accept these digital fiat payments. You can take your digital your digital phone and cash out fiat uh, at the corner store uh, or pay with it. Uh, uh, for some goods and cash out the balance. Uh, uh, so ironically, Digicel has laid out the infrastructure needed for strike. Uh, so all we do oh. is put strike. <laughs> yeah, we put strike on all those Digicel phones and we put strike on all those Digicel points of sale. You, you've uh, you've got you've got a payment structure around buying and selling goods and services before us right. in the West. You're ahead of the curve. That's right. That's right. Because it's such a small economy and it's easy to scale things, we can adopt new technology much quicker uh, without uh, too much bureaucratic tape uh, in between. Uh, so, and as I said, this, collution, this solution is is uh, entirely a, a commercial private sector solution. There's no need uh, for an uh, act of parliament or even endorsement from uh the central bank because you're not is using a financial services operator uh, you're not issuing a currency it just happens to be that the vendors accept that uh, uh, that tender uh, just like uh, they'd accept uh, USD uh, if you happen to have it uh, they do accept it uh, usually but it's dollar for dollar yeah. uh, they won't uh, they're not a currency exchange so they won't give you an exchange rate They'll just take it face value as a Tongan dollar. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually worth nearly three Tongan dollars. Uh, so them accepting Bitcoin is just like that. They're not yep. uh, working as an exchange or, yeah. So uh, that's the commercial solution. The next step uh, would be uh, uh, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender, uh, which President Bukel has already uh, laid out the playbook for. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be given a, an early uh, copy of the bill uh, by the team in El Salvador. Awesome. Um, so you're going order... to follow that? <clears throat> yeah, so in order to uh, submit a new bill, you have to do what's called a gap analysis. Yep. Uh, so you have to make sure that it aligns with the Constitution and doesn't contradict it in any way, yep. and the relevant legislation uh, so our banking and finance legislation, make sure it fits with that. Uh, and you usually send that to the Attorney General's office uh, and they get it done in a, in a couple of months. Um, I've been in hospital, so I had nothing to do. So I did the first half a couple of weeks ago and finished the last half last week. Wow. Uh, so I've got a bill ready to go in Parliament. Wow. Uh, but you just can't things. get home to work on it. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Uh, the only thing barring me from doing that is uh, not being able to get in the country, but the bill's ready to go. Um, and I had not planned on it, but uh, after these uh, plans became public, I was approached by uh, some really generous um, geothermal and wave harnessing uh, energy companies who harness geothermal energy specifically for Bitcoin mining. Yep. Uh, and my island is the only uh, inhabited uh, volcano in the country. Uh, so it's perfect uh, for my estate and my people. Oh, uh, my Lord. 
You're going to yeah, get people right. flocking down there. You're going to get industry flocking down there. I just see a yeah. world where people... I, I follow a guy called Nomad Capitalist, talks about go where you're treated best. And I exactly. feel that the smaller countries, the smaller nations, will start to attract people uh, and industry. Industries will be formed around mining. I, 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 it's incredible. I just find it so and mind-blowing. Mining. This, see, this is the brilliance <coughs> of the Bitcoin community and the technologies it has uh, at its fingertips. So there are 20 other volcanoes in our country. Uh, so in a country of uh, 100,651, that means one volcano for every 4,720 people. <laughs> so for about uh, 4,000 people, you need, yeah, you can get away with about a megawatt. Uh, but each of those volcanoes will produce 95 megawatts. So it will not just power Bitcoin mining, it will power Bitcoin mining and the entire country wow. uh, with uh, hundreds of megawatts left over, literally nearly thousands of megawatts. And uh, if you know anything about electrical engineering, you'll know. No. <laughs> <clears throat> electricity only travels 500 kilometers at a time after that uh, there are no cables uh, that we have the technology for that can still hold voltage it loses voltage after 500 kilometers so it can power bitcoin mining our whole country and samoa and fiji are less than 500 kilometers away so we can export electricity to them the way uh, canada exports electricity to uh, new york uh, and New Jersey. That uh, is exactly. mental. Exactly. That is from... mental. I, I, I sort of, I sort of have heard that they're saying that a lot of energy is wasted because it's not transportable past a certain, you know, distance. I did know that much. But what you're saying and is, that, you could power I'm those other saying. islands because they're near enough. Exactly. They're near enough for us to power them, and start even <clears> after <throat> that, with megawatts left over. Uh, that's how. Uh, yeah, how energy rich this technology is. And that's why, as you see, uh, power can only go so far. That's why Bitcoin mining uh, searches out those that power yep. in the middle of the jungle that no one can get to. Yep. Uh, and they use that power and it's clean. It's got a zero carbon footprint uh, and it costs zero cents per kilowatt hour. So it's a win, 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 win. People don't um, understand that Bitcoin is going to drive a cleaner world. They just don't get it. A hundred percent. They just don't get it. You know, listen to the narrative, uh, it's boiling the oceans. Uh, less than 1%, you know, energy uses a year in in terms yeah, of the whole 160 uh, terawatt or whatever yeah, it is. I can't, Bitcoin, you know, it's just crazy. Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin mining uses the same amount of energy as Christmas lights do annually. And for those of us who are in the Pacific, who are at the, the uh, at the, uh, at the, um, the forefront of the impacts of, uh, climate change uh, we've assessed the data uh, and I do climate change work uh, through with the Commonwealth Secretariat out of uh, Marlborough House in London okay uh, I'm the chairman of the Commonwealth uh, uh, Pacific Parliamentary Human Rights Group anything uh, else you do <laughs> uh, yeah well so I keep I the do, list open <laughs> Corey, um, carry on <laughs> One of the one of the jobs I do is as chairman of uh, GoPack Oceania, uh, and I'm on the world board for GoPack. Uh, it's a global organisation of parliamentarians against corruption, who which is the legislative arm, and the enforcement arm is the UNODC, uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. So when you get KYC AML'd, it's so that that information gets sent to us so that we can monitor the illicit financial flows, uh, usually uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, through uh, NATO, uh, to watch flows to the Middle East, uh, and particularly to ISIS, and to on the other end, uh, to watch flows from uh, the Sinaloa cartel, the Cali cartel, uh, and Medellin uh, for the bricks of Bolivian marching powder uh, that are going the other way. Wow. and the bricks of China white that are coming down from China going the other way. Uh, and in that uh, anti-corruption role, uh, it shows us 
that the regulation of uh, Bitcoin is, uh, yeah, it's very strange if you think about it. It's the only uh, entity that's treated as two different things under the law. Uh, that's actually, uh, uh, yeah, that's contra-legal, that's illegal. So for the purposes of financial uh, uh, monitoring, yep. uh, it's treated as a money. So that's why you get KYC AML because only money uh, uh, causes KYC AML. Yep. But uh, when it comes to taxation, they tax you as an asset. Mm. Uh, so you pay capital gains tax on it. So Tell it's treated as a money and as an asset at the same time, yep. which is, yeah, that's not strictly legal. Uh, and the reason they treat it as an asset so that they can tax you mm. is if it was treated sure. solely as a money, then it's declassified as an asset and you don't pay tax on holding it. Uh, you just pay tax in uh, mm. when you do it in exchange, a forex uh, transaction. Yep. So uh, my work in anti-corruption uh, has made me able to highlight that uh, to the relevant authorities that, uh, yeah, that's why President Biden has uh, pumped $80 billion into the IRS and advertised for 37 thousand new jobs so that the US can try and um, formulate a taxation model and a legislative model around it. So yeah, uh, Bitcoin is is uh, making inroads in every sector uh, and every uh, uh, legal space uh, around the planet. Um, as I said, 5% just bought this week uh, by um, uh, the Australian Sovereign Fund. And uh, on, on the Strip in Las Vegas, uh, all the gentlemen's clubs, uh, in inverted commas, mm -hmm. now accept Bitcoin as payment. Wow, uh, really? So, so, yes, the dancers will have um, either a QR code on a little sticker or tattooed, uh, and you can tip uh, using lightning. It's coming Lord for Situa, it's coming, it's coming slowly, slowly, then suddenly. And Thank I you. think to be in this space and be aware of that, you know, awareness is a key word, isn't it? You don't even need to be, you know, fully, you know, in Bitcoin. You just need to have awareness that something's going on and you will be sucked, in my view, down into that Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I just tell everyone, including my family, for goodness sake, at the very least, get off ground zero. Just get, get off zero. zero, you know, yeah. get, get a bit there of skin in the game you because, you know, I, I see I see a world where I, I think Michael Saylor says 400 trillion the money, you know, something like that. You know, that's going to be sucked into Bitcoin over generations. It might not. I might not see it in my lifetime, but my children and grandchildren will. You yeah, know, it's like I don't want them to say, you know, why didn't you tell me? So therefore, we as Bitcoiners, we've got to almost get under people's skins and, you know, try and get them to wake up and, and see what's going on and not just let it pass them by. When this is, I think it was, who was it said it might have been Max Kaiser. This is a one in 10,000 year occurrence. This exactly. just happens once every 10,000 years. And we're living it's through almost it. The moral, it's almost the moral duty uh, to share it. There are only 21 million of them. Uh, and there are 45 million millionaires on the planet, uh, and they're all going to begin pushing their value. Uh, there's 8 billion of us and 21 million to go around. So do the math. Uh, get off zero now. That is what I say to people. All you have to do, you don't even need to be good with maths. Just get a calculator and try and do the numbers. Divide you know, 8 billion people by 21 million coins. Well, maybe 19 million, because a couple of million are definitely lost. Right. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, it can't be inflated. There can't be any more printed. It is getting scarcer and scarcer every four years. And you've got a, a logical answer that does not take the brains of a rocket scientist to get. It really doesn't. That, and uh, without uh, talking price action, which I never do. No, me neither. Um, <clears throat> the entry points you've got now will never likely come around again. So uh, the sooner you get off zero, uh, the better for yourself. This is not financial advice, but yeah, um, do your descendants a favour.
Well, Lord for Situa, I'm telling you, sir, it has, we've had a bit of a nightmare getting here and I want to publicly on my show apologise to you. And I tell you the reason we got the no, timings well, wrong on the first two, I because I thought you were in Tonga. I was looking at Tonga time, forgetting uh, you were down in New Zealand. But I've got to say, audience, if you haven't enjoyed this content from this guy, then I don't know what planet you're on. You need to tweet this out, people. You need to share it with your family. Say, have a look at this video um, because this is this guy is everywhere. Um, I'm not on Twitter spaces. You are, Lord, for situa. You are everywhere. I keep hearing this every I mean, I, the, the trouble is, is I've got a clubhouse app, but I've got a life. I've got another business and I just don't have the, the time. You know, if I want to enjoy my family and not ignore my family to go into everything. But I understand where you're at. You're led in a hospital bed. So what else have you got to do when I was led in a hospital bed? in 2011 I had flipping nothing to do but read books and it was so boring or pay money for I the know, hospital was, TV <laughs> someone someone reminded me uh, this week they said imagine being stuck there in 2003 with a Nokia phone and oh. snake that's all you'd have to play and I was like oh Oh, no, 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 no. Look, it's been an absolute delight. I thank you for coming on the show. And I really mean it when I say I really hope we get to meet and shake each other's hands in person, in the new world, in the new world. Uh, I'm going to leave you all. Sorry, go on. Uh, And have a drink with you. It's been an absolute... Pleasure. It really has. Um, I, it's been a privilege to be. I'm so on. glad we persisted. I, I really am. Come on again, maybe a year down the road. Let's see where we're going. Let's see what's happening. Um, is, I'm hoping this is the first of many chats. That well, let's see where we go. I want to leave my audience with a quote. I always do this, and I've used this many times before, and it's very, very relevant to what we've just discussed. Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. I believe we're at the uh-huh. then they Thank fight you. you stage, but we will win, people. Buy your Bitcoin. Stack those Satoshis. Uh-huh. Stay strong, people. Uh, thanks for being on, Lords for Situa. It's been an absolute blast. I'm Absolutely. going to leave you all with my social media links. I'm going to say thank you to you. Stick around, and I'll cut it off at the end, and we'll debrief. No but, people, I'll be back on – where are we? What's today? Oh, I've lost track of time. Today's Thursday. I'll be back on Monday, 6 p.m. London, with my regular show. Uh, for now, Lord for Situa from Tonga. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure.